Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. So today, we are going to talk about truth and lies and what's real and what's not in videos. We're going to talk about it in relation to one particular set of videos um, and information, but it, it applies to most in, in this context. But before we get into that, I want to say hi to Carol in Oregon. You, you have people behind you. So, I was asked a question about the videos of captured Russians and whether or not they were telling the truth. You know, if you don't know, there are a lot of videos surfacing of captured Russians and they're saying, I didn't know any, I didn't know what was going on. I had no clue. I thought I was on a training exercise. We didn't know. And there are people wondering if it's true. I don't know. Do you want to believe it? <laughs> Because that matters. Um, but before we get into this, I, I want to... Uh, I, I would feel bad if I didn't mention something. Under the Geneva Conventions, you are supposed to keep prisoners of war safe from public curiosity. You're not supposed to use them for propaganda purposes. Okay? Does that mean that every video you've seen has been a violation? No. No. Sometimes the people capturing them are civilians, and they have no reason to know these rules. Sometimes there's one in particular where there is a captured Russian in a cell, and you can tell that, that he is scared. And they come in, and they, they get him to insult Putin on camera. Yeah, that's a violation. That's a violation. The reason this is in the Geneva Conventions is because this kind of propaganda is incredibly effective. And what you don't want is for one side to come to somebody who's captured and say, hey, you're going to say this or. It leads to a lot of bad stuff. That being said, as far as violations that I've seen, this is kind of the least of the concerns. There's also something called, uh, it's a concept called victor's justice. Basically means we'll sort it out after the war. And if your side wins, well, you really don't have much to worry about. So, in conflicts, people generally greatly underestimate how important the propaganda war is. It shapes, it shapes outcomes a lot. And people tend to ignore it. And sometimes they don't realize when something is propaganda or it's an information operation. Um, in this particular case, it makes sense for both sides to be pushing this narrative. Um, and Generally, in, in war, truth is the first casualty. And if you're running a propaganda operation or an information operation, the, the concept of truth and real, that gets fuzzy real quick. Because it's real if it has a tangible effect on the battlefield. Did, did it make the other side feel bad? Did it demoralize them? Did it boost morale on your side? Did it cause a, an ally to intervene? Because if it did, well, it's real. Is it true? At that point, does it matter? Because it's real. Because it had that impact. You know, is how much of this is true? All of it even the lies, especially the lies. And, that, you know, that's a funny conversation. But the reality is, at the end, those people who believe the lies, they're going to defend them so much more than they would ever defend the truth because they want to believe it. And that's a key part of it. It's a key part of creating good propaganda. The person that uh, it's aimed at has to want to believe it. That pickle story, 
if you don't know, there is a story floating around that a Ukrainian grandma in an apartment building threw a can of pickles at a drone, hit it just right, and sent it crashing into the ground. I have seen zero evidence to back this up. But man, do I want to believe it. That's part of it. That helps shape what becomes real and eventually what becomes truth when you're talking about war. At this point in time, it is incredibly valuable for the Ukrainian side to believe that the Russians didn't know, that they don't want to be there. They want to believe that. Because if that's true, well, maybe they surrender. Maybe they don't fight so hard. Maybe there's a mutiny. It's beneficial if they believe that the Russian soldier doesn't support Putin's war. Gives them hope. And right now, that is something that is in short supply there. From the Russian side, it makes sense too. Tell all of your soldiers, if they get captured, to say this in hopes of creating that tangible effect, better treatment for your troops. It makes sense for both sides to uh, push this narrative. Does it make it true? Eh, not so much. When you look at the videos, some of them really appear coached. Some of them appear completely voluntary. Some of them are unprompted to civilians. Some of them really look like they're just trying to say anything they can think of because they're scared. But it's those that are unprompted that make me lean towards at least some of it being true. Me, personally, I would say that the conscripts, lower enlisted, they didn't have a clue. They didn't have a clue. But that's not really based on the videos. That's based on my belief that there were a whole lot of Russian officers who didn't know what was going on, who should have been involved in the planning, but due to paranoia in the Kremlin, they were kept out of the loop. If officers who should have been involved in the planning didn't know, there's no way the lower enlisted does. And I believe that officers were kept out of the loop because that's one of the few things that can explain a whole lot of the failures on the Russian side. Is that those who uh, were the most trusted by the Kremlin were in that position because they were the most trusted, not because they were the best at the job. So there were a whole lot of people who probably could have pointed some things out that weren't involved in the planning. And we're seeing the effects of that. Um, so what's true, what's real? We're not going to know until afterward. It'll be sorted out after the war. And much like Victor's justice, there will be Victor's truth. A lot of what we know to be true about different conflicts, it may be shrouded. It may be skewed. You can see this if you look at history books from different countries. They highlight different things. Because every nation has its own lens that it views something through. What we see here is not the same as what Russians see in Russia. And it's not just because of media censorship or something like that. It's because there's a national identity. There's a set of beliefs that go along with it. And a lot of it boils down to, do you want to believe it? Because as far as discerning fact from fiction and all of that, that's not really going to happen until the historians get in there afterward. 
and start piecing it all together and start looking at what was made up and what wasn't, what was propaganda, what was designed to influence this side at this particular time. And remember, we're spectators. We're on the sidelines. This stuff isn't really aimed at us. We're just catching bits and pieces of it. But because of our own national lens, we highlight the pickle jar. We highlight the stuff we want to believe. The truth is normally somewhere in the middle. But people will end up defending the lies at the end of it. Anyway, it's just a thought. Y'all have a good day.